we're going to get started here. Welcome everyone to the 14th annual uh, Robert E. Sess Distinguished Lecture. Um, I believe 14 years. Uh, each year uh, we have this uh, lecture to uh, honor the numerous contributions of Bob Sess to not only atmospheric science, but also uh, to Stony Brook and, uh, and the School of Marine Atmospheric Science and so forth. And just a little history of Bob. Bob started here at Stony Brook in the 1970s. Uh, in, this, in mechanical engineering, where he's a faculty member. And uh, basically, from the 1970s to 1990s, um, he wrote several influential papers, uh, basically on the greenhouse effect and related feedbacks uh, on the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, Bob has uh, been retired for several years now. He lives in northern Connecticut. Um, I talked to him yesterday. He's doing good. He's uh, in his best wishes and regards. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. Uh, and by the way, uh, ITP faculty, we need to go up there and see him. Uh, so he, he wants us to come and see him and say, say hi and so forth. Um, but needless to say, Bob founded atmospheric science here at Stony Brook. Um, I mean, he started mechanical engineering, but because of his personality, he, he tended to attract people uh, with his energy and creativity. And uh, a core group got started there, including our own uh, Sultan Hamid. Uh, and then uh, a group came down here in the 19, early 1990s. Uh, and then it's since grown, and now we're up to about 12 faculty members in atmospheric science. So uh, in uh, recognition of uh, uh, Bob's contributions to atmospheric science, uh, we have a distinguished uh, lecture every year with uh, a distinguished atmospheric scientist. And, uh, and today it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Isaac Held, uh, who's a, a senior research scientist at the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory in Princeton, New Jersey. <laughs> Um, Dr. Held is uh, well uh, world-renowned for his work on the dynamics of the Earth's climate system uh, using both theory and models. Um, he does have a Stony Brook connection. Uh, he got his master's uh, here at Stony Brook in physics in 1971 uh, before uh, getting interested in climate and climate modeling where he went to Princeton uh, and got his PhD and so forth. So as I mentioned, he's made uh, uh, many fundamental contributions uh, to the Earth's climate through uh, using both idealized models and co comprehensive climate simulations, numerous pioneering contributions to studying various atmospheric structures ranging from the Hadley cell to mid-latitude storm tracks, uh, and also uh, impacts with global warming. Uh, lots of awards. I can list out here just a few. Uh, the AMS uh, Meisinger Award uh, from the American Meteorological Society in 1987. The NOAA Presidential Rank Award in 2005, and then the highest uh, award in the Mer American Meteorological Society, um, the Rossby Medal. That was in 2008. And he also became a member of the National Academy of Sciences in 2003, and so forth. So he's been a great mentor um, with several students, I think 14 or 15 PhD students uh, you've mm -hmm. mentored or advised through the years. He was also on the, um, uh, the committee for uh, Professor Chang. Uh, when uh, uh, Edmund was getting his PhD uh, in, in Princeton and so forth. So, so I have a plaque here uh, which says in recognition of his outstanding contributions to atmospheric sciences, uh, this plaque is awarded to Dr. Isaac Held, and I thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. So today um, we're going to hear a little bit about theories uh, for the polar heat flux in the atmosphere, history and current status. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Is that fine? Okay, thanks. Uh, make sure I know how this works. Yeah, I just wanted to take a step back today and just think about the, some of the most basic features of the atmosphere as we know it. We spend most of our lives, and I'm no exception, looking at fairly uh, you know, specific problems and details. I'm spending a lot of my time right now on a team trying to develop our next generation global climate model, a GFDL, for example. A lot of details that you have to worry about, some rather technical. And it's kind of nice to just step back and just ask ourselves, what is our basic understanding of some very simple things about our atmosphere. And the one I'm going to focus on here is just the north-south temperature gradient on the Earth and what controls that. There's no mystery that uh, 
at some level, what controls it? What controls the north-south temperature gradient is primarily the transport of heat by eddies in the atmosphere, the eddy uh, sensible heat flux, and to a lesser extent, the late heat flux by large-scale eddies. The highs and lows that we're familiar with on weather maps are transporting heat poleward constantly. And it's the strength of that transport that's controlling the north-south temperature gradient. So if your grandmother asks you, what, you know, why, does, why is the equator 30 degrees centigrade or whatever warmer than the pole, uh, what do you tell her? I mean, what is, the, what is our zeroth order understanding of the fact? Or equivalently, what's controlling the heat flux by eddies in the atmosphere? And I don't think that's, I'm going to give you some thoughts on that. I promised a little history. The history will be very brief. Mostly this will be my attempt at explaining my current picture of um, what I think is the basic dynamics controlling the eddy heat flux. But as you'll see, I'm not sure it's in, uh, the argument is in a form that's easily uh, explained to your grandmother, and which really means that I probably, probably don't understand it very well, because usually when you understand something in depth, you, you're able to communicate it to different kinds of audiences. So this is still a work in progress. And my approach here, as will become clear, is to use a variety of different idealized models to try to isolate uh, the, the essence of this dynamics, and in particular, a particular kind of model that I'll come to in a minute. But first, see what order. Oops. So I'm going to discuss what, in the most simplest terms, is just uh, thinking of the eddies in the atmosphere as turbulent diffusion. And so we want to know what the diffusivity for heat is of the eddies in the atmosphere. And this idea of turbulent diffusion gets criticized a lot. And uh, maybe we can come back to it if people want to talk about it at the end. But I think it's a good starting point for thinking about uh, heat transport in the atmosphere. It's not a very good starting point for thinking about, say, momentum transport in the atmosphere. But we can talk about that later, too. But for heat transport, I think it is. And what that means is you have some you're trying to develop some understanding of some turbulent diffusivity. If you think about a kinematic diffusivity, it just has units of velocity times length, or velocity squared divided by time. That's, so you have to know an eddy length scale and eddy velocity scale, or equivalently a length scale and a time scale. If you think about what are the relevant length and time scales and what's controlling them. That's the, another way of stating the question that I'll be trying to address here. Um, by the way, if you have any questions, just uh, speak up. Historically, I've looked at this diffusive picture quite a bit over the years. And the first paper I ever wrote uh, when I first got to Princeton after just arriving after my master's degree here at Stony Brook. By the way, the campus is unrecognizable. It doesn't look anything. I don't know where I was, but um, um, it was in 1970 or so. Um, you know, I played around with some simple diffusive energy balance models of the climate. I still think those are a great introduction for students thinking about the climate system. Just to program yourself a model that just diffuses heat on the sphere and has a you know, very simple radiative transfer uh, approximation. And you get a feel for what's important and what isn't important, but fundamental to any kind of diffusive energy balance model like that, you have to talk about the diffusivity and what you can just specify it, but you like to, once you start playing around with this kind of model, you start wondering about, well, what in the world is controlling that diffusivity? It's not some God-given number. It's determined by something. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're putting together a simple energy balance model, then the typical diffusivity you'll need will be on the order of 10 to the 6 meters squared per second for kinematic diffusivity or that order of magnitude. So you can think about what length and time scales you need to get that kind of diffusivity. Uh, but there's a more 
fundamental theoretical reason, which I'm going to try to discuss here, that I think for any heat transport in the atmosphere, you can make the case that it's fundamentally diffusive in some sense, and that there is a scale separation, or there's potential for scale separation between the eddies and the large scale inhomogeneities of the system. So that's a sort of a defense of the picture of diffusion. And then I th you can even go further and say maybe there's some laboratory, let's say laboratory, I mean numerical simulation that I can propose that you can think of as measuring the diffusivity of heat on the computer, measuring the diffusivity of heat for mid-latitude eddies as a function of model parameters. And uh, I think I'll talk about that as well. Okay, this picture impressed me when it first generated, actually Paul Kushner generated it uh, 20 years ago. And what this is, first of all, is a plot. This is the northern hemisphere. I think you can see we're just looking at winter. And these vectors are the the eddy heat plugs, V prime, T prime. Just uh, I think there's been a little bit of filtering here to remove the low frequency variability. Uh, and another key to this uh, plot is that we've just taken the divergent component of this vector field, this eddy heat flux. You can think of this field as having a rotational part and a divergent part. And it's only the divergent part that affects the source, gives you a source or sink of changes the temperature field. And if you take the divergent part and plot it like this, and these are the near surface isotherms, you can see that the heat flux is down gradient, tends to be more or less oriented once you remove the rotational part of the flux, tends to be at low levels, tends to be uh, down the local gradient, almost perpendicular to the mean temperature field. So that's observations, reanalysis. So here's a plot you get if you just uh, apply a simple diffusion to the temperature field and get a diffusive heat flux. Uh, that looks pretty good. I mean, if I made a different plot, it wouldn't look that great, but it's, it's, putting, it's just going the right direction. I guess, well, how did I pick the diffusivity uh, to put in to make this plot? And so what we did, and this, you can think of this as a trick, but it's sort of an introduction to a, a technique that I'm going to be using throughout, which is just dimensional analysis. I want to get as far as possible with just dimensional analysis. Um, and um, it will become clearer as I go, but uh, you have to think about what are the important dimensions in the problem. And well, so I could look for eddy, estimate eddy length scales and velocity scales from observations, some RMS velocities, some length scale defined maybe as a mixing length for heat. But instead of doing that, all we did here was just look at the eddy stream function variance in the winter time. And this, I think, is in the mid troposphere. You get pretty much the same picture wherever you look, because this, this eddy, eddy stream function tends to be more equivalent to tropic. Anyway, you see the storm, you know, maximum variability in the storm tracks over the ocean. And so why look at this quantity? It's because it has the, the right units. That's it. It just, if you look at the units of a stream function are the same as the units of a kinematic diffusion. This velocity times length, because if you differentiate the stream function, you get the velocity. So stream function is units of velocity times length. That's exactly the same unit as the diffusivity. So it's just a cheap way of estimating that combination of velocity and length scales that you need. You don't need the velocity and length scales separately. You just need something in units of the diffusivity. It seems like cheating, but I think it actually works pretty well. Um, I may come back to this picture later. I don't know if there are any questions about it. I think it's the only observational picture that I'm going to show. <laughs> uh, I just want to, um, I'm not going to be talking about this local structure of the diffusivity, 
for the rest of this talk. And just by thinking about models, climates that are zonally symmetric. Um, and how about this uh, issue of uh, a scale separation? You think if you're diffusing something, you want to have some mean free path or mixing length that's small compared to the scale of the mean gradients over which you know the flow is very inhomogeneous. But a uh, this is a rough sketch, obviously from a something uh, old lecture I had. If you think about uh, the simplest kind of non-rotating convection, Baynard convection in the laboratory, where you have two temperatures and say it's gravitationally unstable and you start getting convective rolls between these plates. Just a classic laboratory problem of convection. And what you find is that the dominant energy containing eddies, the eddies doing most of the transport of heat in this problem, have the scale of the distance between these two plates. What other scales are there in this problem? You could say maybe there's some boundary layer scale that depends on a Rayleigh number or something. You know, so but if you're in the limit of very small uh, viscosity or thermal conductivity, there are no other scales. And the observations are of this system or, or models confirm that uh, there's no scale separation in this problem. And so you wouldn't think of applying a diffusive theory to that problem. At least I wouldn't. But imagine a different kind of convection problem the, in which there's, let's say, the flow is confined spatially in this direction, and you're transporting heat in this direction. So you could think of a chimney, but it turns out a chimney doesn't work, but let's just ignore that for the moment. Uh, and so the eddies think, well, it's very nonlinear. They're gonna, nonlinearity doesn't know about up, down, or east, west. You're just gonna try to isotropize the eddies, sort of make them kind of roundish. And uh, so I'd argue that this scale is going to oppose itself on the, the dominant scale of the eddies uh, in this problem. Um, yeah. Now I think that probably happens in this case. The problem with the chimney analogy is that you have a big mean flow going through the system. You may not care about the eddies. So. And uh, there's an analogy here with the, the atmosphere. We want to turn this on its side and think about transport from equator to the pole. And the argument that there's a scale that's determined not by the scale of the inhomogeneity in the direction of the transport, but it's determined by, fundamentally by inhomogeneity in the direction perpendicular to the transport. And in this kind of predominantly geostrophic atmosphere that we have, the mean flow is suppressed and so the eddies dominate. And so we don't have to worry about flow through the chimney, mean flow through the chimney. And we end up with a system that's dominated potentially by eddies for which there's scale separation because their scale is not determined by <coughs> some horizontal well, you know, scale specified by the problem. I don't know if that makes sense, but we'll probably come back to it. Just I just put this in here to show that this idea of trying to uh, replace uh, eddies in the ocean, we have very similar dynamics to what we have in the atmosphere, except it occurs on quite a bit smaller scale in the mesoscale eddy fields in the ocean. These are numerical simulations at rather coarse resolution. This is one degree, and this is six to degree. And there's a lot going on here. Um, and if you go to higher resolution, this looks a little more eddy-like. Right? Uh, in oceanography, it's a big question of how to parameterize the heat transport by eddies that you don't resolve in uh, uh, coarse resolution global climate models. So a lot of the discussion of these scaling arguments is in the last few decades has actually been in the oceanographic literature, not in the atmospheric literature. Um, I'm going to use quasi geostrophic theory to. I have a question. Sure. So, for the ocean case, the scale separation definitely works in the mm -hmm. sense that the ocean eddy is much smaller than yeah. the very scale. But 
in the atmosphere, I don't see such a scale. You know, there's not much to work with, I admit. But I'm going to have a slide that, if I get to it, we'll address that question. So, uh, but that's the key thing. You just look at the atmosphere, and you know, where's that scale separation? I mean, yeah, these are pretty big. Um, that's a key point. I don't think we can get very far in discussing eddy dynamics in a, uh, a way that uh, gives us insight into eddy scales, velocity or length scales without using quasi geostrophic theory. I just don't, there's very little that we can do without making the quasi geostrophic approximation in this problem, I think. And uh, just a little quote from Ed Lorenz, with which I completely agree that the, what he's referring to, reduction of the dynamic equations to a single prognostic equation, that's equations for the potential vorticity, is the greatest single achievement of 20th century dynamic meteorology. I agree with that completely. I've had a love affair with quasi-geostrophic theory, uh, mostly unrequited, I think. Uh, but I've, uh, it's just a beautiful theory. Uh, it gives us tremendous insight into the atmosphere. The trouble with the theory, or maybe sometimes it's an advantage in that you can't pose it on the sphere because it breaks down in, in the tropics. Uh, so over my career, I've worked with a lot of different kinds of idealized models. And you try to match the idealized model to the problem that you're doing. And this is for thinking about the eddy heat flux in the atmosphere. I really think that you can think about quasi geostrophic theory, and you don't have to be on a sphere. You can be on a beta plane where you've just approximated part of the sphere with a Coriolis force, which is a linear function of latitude. And if I'm thinking about things like going from why are the surface westerlies? where they are and how those westerlies move with global warming or some change in the system. Like, then you have to be on the sphere and you have to, you can't use QG theory. Maybe you could use uh, a dry GCM if you think moisture is not a critical element in the dynamics. And then there's some questions where you need moisture, but you can still idealize the problem, for example, by eliminating clouds or in, in both of these cases, you can consider climates which are zonally symmetric, where there are no continents or oceans. Uh, I like to move them back, back and forth among this hierarchy, but for this talk, I'm going to be up here in the, the most idealized QG part of this uh, hierarchy of climate models. So we start with linear, the classic uh, problem, and this is why quasi-geostrophic theory was initially discovered by, first by Edie and then uh, most prominently by Jules Charney. It was to try to understand uh, the linear instability of flows in the atmosphere. What is the source of the eddies that we see in mid-latitude? And I'm not a historian of science, but if you go back to the literature in the 1930s and early 1940s, there's really a lot of confusion. There's nothing, uh, you know, Fluid dynamicists knew that you, there were instabilities that occurred when the richest number of the atmosphere was small, for example, uh, stratified shear instabilities. There are also instabilities when the Rossby number of the atmosphere is large, like inertial instabilities, they're often called. But not, neither of those looks like what we see as the dominant eddies in mid latitude. And so the problem is what kind of instabilities can you, can you get in a fluid when the richest number is large and the Rossby number is small? And the development of quasi-geostrophic theory, first by Edie, was the, uh, showed that, in fact, there are instabilities, periclinic instabilities, we call them. And Edie's classic problem, he had no beta effect. He had a constant Coriolis parameter, had a linear shear with UDZ as a constant, uniform stratification, N squared, gravitational stratification. And it was confined between rigid lids at the surface and, if you like, uh, tropopause at a constant h. And he found the fundamental result that the most unstable mode had the uh, 
you know, scaled with the parameters parameters of the problem by this by the static stability times the height of the fluid divided by the Coriolis parameter, or it's the height of the, the depth of the fluid multiplied by this non-dimensional Prandtl ratio or something. Both N and F have units of frequency. And that's just the radius of deformation or the Rossby radius, depending on what you want to call it. And uh, the growth rate of these instabilities, often called the ED growth rate, is, is just this number, which we can think of as also, we can write it as F divided by some square root of a richest number if you want to. Um, and these two, if you look at the literature on um, atmospheric storm tracks and, um, you know, these two concepts uh, permeate that literature, the, the radius of deformation and the ED growth rate. Um, now there, and so the first, uh, thing you might speculate is that the radius of deformation is what controls the length scale of the eddies in the atmosphere. And I think that's what you see in most uh, textbooks. I don't look at textbooks that much anymore. That's one of the advantages when you get to a certain age. Uh, but uh, the, I'm pretty sure that's still the case. That it's just taken for granted that this linear theory is explaining the scale of eddies in the atmosphere. I want to convince you that that's not the case. I really want to argue that that's an outdated notion and that it has, the race of deformation actually has relatively little to do, it seems like a startling statement, it has relatively little to do with the scale of eddies in the atmosphere. Anyway, that's what I'm going to try to convince you of. You can say this is not a complete theory. You can say, well, maybe H is given uh, to the extent that the tropopause height is given by something else. That's also arguable, but F is given, but what determines the static stability? You'd have to couple your theory for your static stability to this argument about uh, the race deformation to say something about the scale of eddies in the atmosphere for first principles. And if you go back in the literature on sort of turbulent diffusion arguments for the heat transfer in the atmosphere, uh, there are these two papers by Stone and Green, which I think are the foundation for that kind of argument back in the 70s. And you can come up with these scales in different ways, but Stone basically just assumed the relevant length scale, the mixing length, is the radius of deformation. Why not? He also assumed that the typical RMS velocity of the eddies was scaled with the mean kinetic energy. The eddy kinetic energy was comparable to the mean kinetic energy. So the eddy velocity, which I'm calling V, is comparable to a mean uh, velocity, a zonal mean jet speed in the atmosphere. I think you can think of it as like a vertically averaged wind speed. Say. And that seems a little arbitrary. It's about what you see in the atmosphere, actually. Eddy kinetic energy is comparable to the zonal kinetic energy for the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, in fact, that's a s piece of information. I when I'm putting together an idealized model of the atmosphere, I'm thinking, am I in a re reasonable Earth-like parameter regime? That's the first thing I check. Is my eddy kinetic energy about comparable to my zonal kinetic energy? That's a good place to start. Uh, but you can make this argument in a different way, and I think Stone did, did this. I'm not sure. I have to go back to his paper, but it's equivalent to assuming that the eddy kinetic energy is proportional to the zonal available potential energy. I won't stop to define the zonal available the available potential energy here, but it's it's the potential energy that is in the system because of the existence of temperature gradients, horizontal temperature gradients. Um, it's the source of energy for mid-latitude eddies, which is to say that mid-latitude eddies grow as the center of mass by re lowering the center of mass of the atmosphere. So you get the potential energy out and converting it to kinetic energy. And if you just take how, compute how much zonal available potential energy there is within a region, a north-south extent equal to the radius deformation, that 
is equivalent, and you say that's how much you typically convert into eddy kinetic energy. You take that zonal available potential energy over a scale of a radius of deformation, convert it into kinetic energy. That will give you the scaling that the eddy and zonal kinetic energies are comparable. And so if you just create a diffusivity from that, you get NHU over F, which, for example, it gives you a, uh, a diffusivity that's proportional to the mean, uh, say, jet speed, which means <coughs> the mean jet speed in, say, mid-latitudes is proportional to the temperature gradient. So you have a diffusivity proportional to the temperature gradient. And if you multiply that by a temperature gradient to get a heat flux, you get a heat flux proportional to the square of the temperature gradient. And if you look under the hood of a lot of ocean models, and say, how are they treating the diffusivity of heat by mesoscale eddies in the ocean? For example, you'll, you'll find in many models that the diffusivity is proportional to the square of a temperature gradient. And I think that's, this is the source, the original source of that idea. You can rewrite this, if you like, as the rate of deformation squared divided by the ED growth rate, which is a nice way of remembering it. It is the length squared over time. Then John Green, 1972, British scientist. I don't think he was aware of what Stone was doing. Um, this is related to Edmund's point. He said, I don't know about the radius of deformation. I'm just going to assume the eddies have the scale of the planet. They're just filling up, uh, you know, the available space between the pole and the equator. And they're as big as they can get. Basically. This is just a scaling argument. You can put in some number there. And so he basically ended up with a diffusivity that was just a constant, so extra symbol there, uh, divided by the E D growth rate. But fundamentally, he was assuming, I should have written here, that the length scale was just uh, the radius of the Earth, which I'm calling A here, rather than the radius deformation. So I think these are the two classic theories for uh, sort of simple turbulent diffusivity in the atmosphere. Uh, as I see it. Uh, okay, so now I'm gonna, I wanna make progress, I wanna think about the simplest system I can to approach this question more theoretically or very con tightly controlled numerical experiment. So I'm gonna go down to a two-layer quasi-geostrophic system. This was introduced by Norman Phillips, again in the late 1940s, and Ed Lorenz and uh, Joe Podlaski wrote a long series of papers, all based on this two-layer QG model. They can think of it a couple different ways. It's just a crude vertical differencing of the quasi-geostrophic equations. They only have two uh, layers of uh, velocity, upper troposphere and lower troposphere, two stream functions. And the difference between those two stream functions by thermal imbalance or Margoules relation or whatever you want to call it, um, is this interface position and which is related to the available potential energy. You have some reduced gravity. And then you write down the quasi-geostrophic equations for that system. And again, you get a radius of deformation, uh, mod entering as a parameter into the problem. In this case, the radius of deformation is determined by the reduced gravity. And it's very closely related to the radius of deformation we just looked at. And, um, Okay, so this is a this is a complete system except if you have to add some forcing and dissipation to get a climate model out of this. This is just the inviscid dynamics of the model. And that's about as simple as you can get, I think, and still retain something that you think is relevant for mid latitude atmospheric dynamics. And over the years I've become convinced that this at model actually contains a lot of the dynamics of the mid latitude atmosphere. And in fact there are a couple of instances where we, I should say my students, have noticed features uh, in this simulations of this two-layer model and then looked in the atmosphere and found those things in the atmosphere, which doesn't happen that often. But uh, in fact, it just happened recently. There's a little story there. But, um, okay, so I won't... Could you list, like, analog of no, lower troposphere and upper troposphere. 
So think of the stratosphere as being out of the picture here. So the whole picture here is you have a flow in the lower troposphere it's interacting with the flow in the upper troposphere through this rather curious kind of quasi-geostrophic way that the flows interact. If you stare at this equation, you can see that if you're on scale small compared to the radius of deformation, these two layers decouple. They don't interact. They only couple on scales longer or comparable to the radius of deformation. That's the, so that's the key parameter here that controls. Otherwise, you just have two-dimensional flow in each layer if you don't have any coupling. So radius of deformation is obviously a key parameter here. There's a little simulation. I started using these biological analogies, which I like a lot. But so I, I label these idealized models with some organism. The molecular biologists have these hierarchy of organisms. They call them model organisms that they work with. So this is my E. coli of climate models. It's, you might be able to get a little bit simpler than this, but not much. <laughs> Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this. In fact, the time is flying, but I think you can make an argument for why a two-layer model looks like a reasonable way of at least simulating the Earth's atmos mid-latitude atmosphere as we know it by thinking about the structure of this overturning circulation in, uh, in the wintertime in isentropic coordinates. I don't think I have time to discuss this in detail, but I think the, this is something I've never published, but I think it's an, there's an argument here that I think is worth looking at in detail of why, if you actually go to more than two layers in a crazy geostrophic system, you don't gain very much. In fact, you can make the model worse. Um, now, I'm going to make one additional simplification, which is I want to, so when, a picture like this was created by imposing on the flow or relaxing the flow to some localized temperature gradient in, in the middle of this channel. This is a re-entering channel. This is the potential vorticity field <coughs> that comes out. Um, but that's still a pretty complicated system. It's inhomogeneous in, in this direction. It's homogeneous in this direction. But I can go even farther, and this is where people start questioning your sanity a little bit, but uh, I really want to create a homogeneous, completely horizontally homogeneous atmosphere, model atmosphere, in which there's just heat transport propagated through this homogeneous system. And so the way you do that, and this is um, quite a few papers written on this system now over the years, and it's perfectly well behaved. And the, way, the fact that it's well behaved is proving to you or to me that you do have scale separation in this system because otherwise it wouldn't make any sense to do this. You assume you have the, the flow is a uniform flow. It has different magnitude in the upper and lower layers. So you have a vertical shear. So you have the potential for baroclinic instability. So you have a temperature gradient across this domain. But then the departure from that mean flow is assumed to be doubly periodic. That's not only periodic in the x direction, but periodic in the y direction. So what goes out here comes in here. So this is a horizontally homogeneous turbulence, the kind of thing that you really love to look at if you're a theorist. You, just, you can focus on just the do domain average properties of the fluid and not think about how things depend on anything spatially. All the whole climate is independent of latitude and longitude. How do we deal with sclerosis? It's not periodic. Yeah, that's, you know, when you just think about when you put on, you work with the beta effect. You assume there's a uniform vorticity gradient in, a, say, QG model with the beta effect. The QG is fundamental here. Because in QG theory, there's no uh, bare Coriolis parameter. It's only beta that occurs. And otherwise, the Coriolis parameter is hidden in the radius of deformation. And so there's no bare Coriolis parameter, so you don't have to think about the, the uh, discontinuity in the Coriolis force between the top and bottom. It doesn't enter in the equation, though. That's a subtlety. But physically, beta means that Coriolis is increasing in certain direction. Yeah. But here it's increasing, increasing, increasing. Increasing, 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 increasing. Yeah. It doesn't matter because 
the eddies are small. I make the analogy with if you're going into a laboratory and you want to measure the resistivity of a piece of metal and you put a voltage across it and you measure the current. But how do you know you're not creating a particle accelerator? Because uh, you know, you, your electron could keep on picking up energy as it goes through. It. And it will if you, you create a short, short circuit if your resistance isn't big enough. But the point is that in, the, in that case and in this case, the heat transport is just a short distance. It's not the full uh, size of the domain. So that's a key point that you get statistically steady states out of this system. Uh, so we've gone from this problem to this one now. That's horizontally homogeneous. So now we have a heat, and you end up with a heat transport through this system that's down the temperature gradient. And you get an energy cycle, you get baroclinic eddies generated, they form, they dissipate. Uh, and you get a diffusivity. Here I've non dimensionalized the diffusivity by Stone's theory, which is the strength of the uh, shear in the wind times the radius of deformation. But in general, this diffus non dimensional diffusivity will depend on some model parameters. Let's not even worry about what they are. But, but first thing I want to show is okay, we want to develop a theory for this diffusivity, but before we do that, let's just measure the diffusivity. So you go into the computer and you just vary these parameters all over the place and you can tabulate them or fit them and you get a theory for the diffusivity in this very esoteric, idealized, baroclinically unstable homogeneous turbulence system. And we've done that and then you can compare to your simulations when you have a localized jet in the system. And this is a paper, I don't have the date here, it was about 20 years ago, Valentina Pavan. Right? And so you don't have a theory for this turbulent diffusivity, you just do this homogeneous simulation and then tabulate the result. And then you use that just as a local diffusivity to predict the uh, heat flux or PV potential vorticity flux, they're closely related in the system. And these are for simulations where we increase the width of the unstable region. And it's sort of related to Edmund's question of, can you trust this sort of theory when the eddies are comparable to the scale of the jets? Or does it only work when the jets are much wider than the eddies, as in this case? And so we can sort of watch the theory break down. The heat flux increases as the radiano scale of the jets increase because they have more available potential energy available to the system. Uh, the bottom line though is it works pretty well. You can take a, um, a measurement in the sense of this numerical apparatus of the turbulent diffusivity and apply it to inhomogeneous problems as we have in the atmosphere. So this paper doesn't get much attention but it really had an effect on me. And I don't think it works this well in all cases. There may be a certain regime in which it works in another regime, which it doesn't work, but people haven't looked at it very much. Um, okay, I'm going to uh, let's say, what does the theory look like? And what is this alternative to the radius deformation as the characteristic scale? And we're not going to get all the way through, but I just want to indicate to you the way this argument goes. And the starting point will be just talking about two-dimensional flow. And uh, so this is just advection of vorticity by two-dimensional flow. This is just, this Jacobian is just notation for advection uh, by the flow, non-divergent flow associated with the stream function psi. So we're just advecting a non-divergent flow in two dimensions. But we're going to add, well, before we do that, there's uh, just to remind you of what I think is the most, one of the most amazing results in the, all of the literature on fluid dynamics is bar none, and that is this fundamental distinction between two-dimensional and three-dimensional flow. And in two dimensions, you energy, if you, if you throw some energy into the system at some scale, it moves to larger scale. The variance of the vorticity, or the entropy, moves to smaller scale, but the energy uh, typically moves to larger scale on average. We have this inverse cascade of kinetic energy, which is quite a remarkable thing if you think about it. 
I think, uh, and it's fundamental for all of meteorology and all numerical weather, I don't think numerical weather prediction would be possible without this inverse energy cascade. The energy tends to stick around in the three-dimensional turbulence, like a pipe flow. I don't think, if the atmosphere were turbulent in the same sense as a pipe flow, I think numerical weather prediction would be impossible. The atmosphere is much more amenable to numerical simulation because the energy sticks around. In fact, it moves to larger scale and then it has to be removed in some other way, typically by surface friction, by rubbing it against the ground, or um, not by a horizontal cascade to small scales. Uh, but then what stops this inverse cascade? Does it just get stopped by friction? And here's the basic argument that I think is the essence of what I think is the right explanation for eddy scales in the atmosphere, for the eddy diffusivity. What we call the Rhine scale. Dr. Peter Rhines, who's thinking about oceanography when he wrote this paper. <coughs> so we add, <coughs> we look at a two dimensional flow like this, but we add the beta effect that gives us Rossby waves. The gradient of the, uh, the radial component of the vorticity of the solid body rotation, that's the beta effect. And then we have this equation. So as it puts energy gets put in the system at some scale, it moves to larger scale. And the beta effect can uh, suppress or modify the way in which, let's just think of the simplest case where you think about um, what happens, well, going around circles a little bit, but there's an amazing thing about Rossby waves that unlike most waves we know, that when the larger the horizontal scale, K here is wave number, the larger the horizontal scale, the faster the waves are. So it just goes like beta over a wave number, beta times the length scale gives you the frequency of the wave. <coughs> beta over k. I think I said I wrote that right. Um, what that means is that as the energy moves to a larger scale, um, eventually you reach a point where the characteristic time scale of the eddies becomes comparable to the time scale of the Rossby waves. You can just dimensional analysis. And Rhines argues that at that point, the turbulence evolves into a set of a bunch of Rossby waves, and then it no longer cascades energy efficiently. In fact, it tends to move energy into zonal jets, which are uh, an interesting part of the story. But basically, it stops the cascade to to uh, larger horizontal scale or slows it down. And if you just do dimensional analysis, it's at this Rhine scale, which is determined by the energy level in the flow divided by beta. You think of this as the eddy kinetic energy. So that's the sort of classical definition of the Rhine scale. It's what stops. Uh, it's the scale at which the beta effect stops the inverse cascade of energy to a larger scale. So let's just make a different kind of dimensional argument. Before I do that, I'm just going to remind you of an argument that you may have seen in discussions of three-dimensional turbulence, where you have a direct cascade to smaller and smaller scales of the energy with this classic Kolmogorov minus five-thirds spectrum that you can also get from a simple scaling argument. The essence of that scaling argument is that you say that a key parameter in this problem is the rate at which energy is cascading down this spectrum, epsilon. That's energy per unit time, the rate of energy cascade, which is also the rate of energy loss and the rate of energy gain. So that has units of energy divided by time, or length squared over time cubed. And so let me ask the question of the Kolmogorov microscale. At what point does this cascade stop and molecular diffusion take over and the flow becomes laminar? That's called the Kolmogorov microscale. You can go through different kinds of arguments and say, assuming this spectrum, where's the Reynolds number become order one? Or the simplest way of getting the answer is just to say your molecular viscosity as units again of length squared over time. And so what length can I create from this energy cascade rate? 
and the viscosity, and this is the combination. And so that will give you the result that for typical epsilons in the atmosphere, you'll get about one millimeter or something for uh, this uh, Kolmogorov microscale. Just a dimensional argument. Let me make the same kind of argument for the Rhine scale, but now I'm going to assume the, a statistically steady picture where I have energy cascading up the spectrum with, at the rate epsilon. And now I want to, f in terms of epsilon rather than the energy level, I want to know what the scale is at which the energy stops. And I'm just going to uh, have a shortcut, gives me the right answer. Uh, I'm assuming that all I know, all I have is this rate of energy cascade and beta. Beta has units of one over length times time. It's a gradient of a vorticity. So what do you get? In terms of wave number, you get this result, or the wavelength would be epsilon over beta cubed to the one-fifth power. Seems pretty esoteric, but that's the Rhine scale in this sort of statistically steady picture, where instead of relating it to the energy level, we relate it to the rate that energy is moving through the system. I think that's a much better way of thinking about it. And you can then ask the question, you have a length scale, by the same kind of dimensional argument, you can get a velocity scale. How do I get a velocity scale from the rate at which energy is moving through the system? And beta, that's the answer. Or a diffusivity. The diffusivity becomes epsilon to the three-fifths or beta to the minus four-fifths. Pretty strange looking combination of parameters. Does that have anything to do with anything at all? First of all, does it have anything to do with this two-layer QG homogeneous model. I wrote a few papers on this a number of years ago, and this is comparing the predicted diffusivity with the diffusivity simulated in this homogeneous turbulence model. And this is comparing the predicted diffusivity goes like epsilon to the three-fifths, beta to the minus four-fifths. So you measure epsilon, the rate at which energy is flowing through the system. And it works pretty well. That's sort of explaining I'm shoveling a few things under the carpet here, obviously. Uh, it's the zeroth order. We, uh, it, it's the best we've done at explaining what's happening in this homogeneous turbulence model. It's surprising it does this well. It's saying that simple dimensional arguments work for this system. And I'll, gonna, I think I'll skip this. So the, a little more explanation. This is just to say there have been some papers where people show this doesn't always work. But this uh, theory for diffusivity says that as the rotation rate goes to zero, the diffusivity uh, gets larger and larger. And that doesn't happen in this homogeneous turbulence model. And there have been papers that say in that limit you have to think about the dependence on the surface friction. For example, but here's a paper. Uh, this paper didn't really register in my consciousness right away. I just been going back to it over and over again, and it gets very few citations. But I think it's pretty important. And all they did was take a standard atmospheric model and just vary the parameters a lot. And all, they vary the rotation rate. They vary the north-south temperature gradient. A few other things. And they just plotted the uh, eddy scale uh, that they estimated in their model. And here they estimated a mixing length. So they're thinking about ultimately getting a diffusivity. And they compare their theoretical, um, the, the mixing length they got in the GCM. This is a full comprehensive model with continents and uh, clouds and latent heat release and everything. Uh, and they compare against the radius of deformation as simulating that model. And there's just, if the theory works, it would be along this line. And there's just no relationship between the radius of deformation and what they get in these simulations, which is interesting. Okay. So what if they use the Rhine scale? And here I'm saying the Rhine scale they're using is give, they're giving themselves the rate of energy production dissipation epsilon and they're fitting against this function. 
that's the best they can do, comparing against any quote-unquote theories for the length scale is using this rather obscure expression that's just dimensional analysis. And if you give yourself the uh, strength of the energy cycle and beta, uh, this is the only length scale you have. That works. Same thing for the velocity. It works even better. This is that velocity scale you get from beta and the uh, strength of the energy cycle. It works almost perfectly. And then the diffusivity, here they plotted it as a heat flux. They multiplied their diffusivity by a temperature gradient. But they're using this diffusivity that goes like epsilon uh, to the 3 fifths, beta to the minus 4 fifths. And these are the various things that are varying. And again, it seems to uh, work pretty well. For some reason, maybe because it was published in Nature rather than a journal that most of us read. <laughs> Uh, it just didn't get much of attention, but I think it's the best. What fascinates me is that this works for a full GCM with all its complexity, latent heat release and everything, qualitatively, but we worried about it. And recently I've gone back to this with a student, and she you know, read this paper carefully, of course, and found that they didn't really test the theory, um, well, sneakily maybe, towards uh, in the regime where the rotation rate was smaller than the Earth's rotation rate. They say they're varying the rotation rate here, but they're, they're only increasing the rotation rate. They're not decreasing the rotation rate. Which is kind of mysterious. So then the student, instead of working with the full GCM, she just took one of these dry spherical primitive equation models that we played with over the years and looks carefully at this way of plotting is the model's diffusivity for heat or this heat flux. Right? And, and this is the Earth-like value here, this solid dot. And we chose in the constant of proportionality in the theory, it's just a scaling argument, so that the theory goes through this control value exactly. So you get some number here, it's order one. Otherwise, we assume the diffusivity goes like, again, epsilon to the three-fifths, beta to the minus four-fifths. And here we're varying the rotation rate. And here the rotation rate starting out very small, even zero. And then we're increasing the rotation rate. Then we get to the Earth-like value. And then for rotation rates larger than the Earth-like value, the theory works very nicely, just as in the this Nature paper by Barry et al. But for smaller rotation rates than the Earth, the theory doesn't work at all. And let's, I don't have time to discuss uh, varying other parameters. Let's just focus on rotation rate. So there's an, let's say an obvious or solution to this problem, and that is as you decrease the rotation rate, the eddies get larger. As you increase the rotation rate, the eddies get smaller, as predicted by the theory. And you find that if you replace these, your theory for the length scale in this regime just by the radius of the Earth, as in John Green's original theory, you see the, those points then also collapse onto this line. You get this interesting non-monotonic behavior of the heat flux as a function of rotation, where the, where the observed value is close to the maximum. Actually, the Earth's rotation rate in this model gives you about the maximum heat flux that you can achieve. And you decrease on both sides of that. The theory captures that pretty well. Uh, so you just have to, this theory only works, as Edmund was saying, when the eddy scale is small compared to the radius of the planet. And the Earth is marginal there. In fact, it's kind of in this simple model. It's sort of right at the transition, where as you increase the rotation rate, it looks like you follow this kind of simple Rhine scaling argument very nicely. And for smaller rotation rates, you have to assume the scale of the atmospheric eddies is fixed and by the geometry to uh, get the thing to work. So this is sort of cemented in my own mind that there are certain regimes here where this, I won't, this is increasing the rotation rate. Gives you another, something else to worry about. Um, I think the argument here works very well. And then again, you can look at the radius deformation. Radius deformation just doesn't uh, there's no parameter range that we found where as you vary a parameter, the rotation 
the radius deformation tells you how the scale of the eddies in the atmosphere actually changes when you. Um, what is it in the rotation rate that's yeah. responsible for that? For, well, I mean, the rotation rate dependence of the. This theory is telling you how beta is proportional to the rotation rate. The thing is, you decrease. And say what? This is a theory. As you decrease the rotation rate, the length scale increases. You say that's the reason in this theory. So it's in, it's in the beta. Yeah. So if you're thinking about a radius of deformation, you say it was in F, but you'd get qualitatively the same result. But it wouldn't fit the. Uh, let me just fin up, finish up because I'm afraid I'm going over time, speaking too slowly. This has all been in terms of epsilon. So how do you get a handle on epsilon? If you go back to our this turbulence problem, Oops, well, let me just put it on the board. Um, it's in there somewhere. In this two-layer quasi-geostrophic model, you can argue that the diffusion gives you a heat flux, diffusion times the temperature gradient. In the homogeneous model, the temperature gradient is just fixed. It's a fixed environment. You get a heat flux, and that gives you the heat flux times the temperature gradient multiplied by another factor of the temperature gradient gives you the production of eddy available potential energy. It's the heat flux times the temperature gradient. Think about the Lorentz energy diagram that you may have uh, studied in your dynamics classes. Uh, so the generation of available potential energy is the diffusion times the temperature gradient squared. And the, that generation of energy you can set, is determining what epsilon is. That's the rate at which energy is flowing through the system. And so that you, you can show again by that, I'll just talk about dimensions here, that epsilon looks like the diffusivity times a uh, temperature gradient squared. But if you get your units right, it's just, turns out it's just the diffusivity divided by the ED growth rate squared. And that's, for the two-layer homogeneous model, that's a, just a rigorous result. And we have this result that D is epsilon to the 3 fifths beta to the minus 4 fifths. So you can solve these two equations simultaneously, and you can eliminate epsilon, and then you get a diffusivity that's a function of the beta and the ED growth rate. And it looks like 1 over beta squared T ED cubed. So you can do that and get a closed theory for the QG homogeneous system, where you eliminate epsilon, and you just get a diffusivity in terms of the parameters of the system. This ED growth rate is just a function of the vertical shear and the static stability. But when we compare this theory, this final theory, to the GCMs, it doesn't work very well. That's what we're struggling with. That this part of the theory that I've been describing to you today seems to work beautifully, even in the full model. If we know how much energy is flowing through the system, we can estimate the diffusivity. But then if we use that diffusivity to estimate how much energy is flowing through the system and solve these equations simultaneously, we get a theory that doesn't work very well. So what we're focusing on is this part of the argument. And maybe the way to think about something that works in the QG system is not working in the full primitive equation case. And we're suspecting that one way of proceeding is to think about an entropy budget rather than available potential energy. Available potential energy is kind of a funny quantity, and especially when you go to a moist atmosphere. Uh, I mean, Ed Lorenz talks about moist available potential energy, but it's hard to work with and not sure what it means. It seems pretty arbitrary. But an entropy budget is unambiguous, whether it's a dry atmosphere or a moist atmosphere. And the entropy budget is very closely related to the generation and dissipation of kinetic energy. So we're thinking that we can get a cl completely closed system by taking this expression and combining it with some 
statements about the entropy budget, which then um, closed the problem. But that's still where we're struggling. So just the entropy is destroyed in the atmosphere by, if you like, radiation. You're heating warm regions and cooling cold regions, which is increasing temperature gradient, which is destroying entropy. But that's balanced by entropy generation, which has to be due to irreversible mixing. And at least in a dry model, the dominant process is just diffusion of momentum, just dissipation of kinetic energy. If that's the only thing that's going on, then you can relate the, the rate at which you're generating and destroying kinetic energy to the radiation in a rather simple way. Uh, it's, you, the entropy destruction, you're balancing the production with the destruction. And so it's a magnitude of the heating and cooling kind of delta T over T, basically a kind of Carnot efficiency. So that's the kind of thing we're thinking about. And the moist model, the extra feature, it turns out, is that frictional, uh, it's not just diffusion of momentum that's an important irreversible uh, source of entropy, you also have to worry about diffusion of water vapor, which can be bigger than effective diffusion momentum. It's hard to get your mind around some of these issues related to the entropy balance of the atmosphere. So that's what we're thinking now. The other thing which may be useful to do, and uh, maybe it's good for a, a thesis, I'm not sure, just to go back to this kind of picture and just see what we can learn by going back to the seasonal cycle and uh, various other cl climate variability that's uh, just studying this kind of relationship between the effective diffusivity and the eddy length and time scale the eddy heat flux. Maybe we'll get some insights from uh, observations that might be relevant to this diffusive picture. I think that's going to be hard, but the answer is pretty complicated. Now, right now I have a student trying to think about this entropy budget uh, closure. So that's as far as I've gotten. But none of these arguments that I'm working on, at least, relate to the radius of deformation. So I'll just leave you with the final thought that when you see someone just assume, whether it's a lecture in a class or a textbook, that the eddies in the atmosphere have the scale they do because of linear baroclinic instability occurring on the radius of deformation, I would just think about questioning that and just don't take that at face value. And if you're really concerned about it, I would try to go to some of this literature, which is, and so a lot of it's in the oceanographic literature that's pointing in a very different direction in terms of the Rhine scale. You have to take the inverse energy cascade seriously. You have to stop that cascade. And quantitatively for the Earth's atmosphere, it's kind of marginal. It's not doing that much. Uh, there's not much of a cascade. But if you start varying parameters, you have to think about it. Sorry I went over a little bit. Thanks for listening. I don't know if you have to, everyone's late for their classes or something. Right. So I'm confused now. So is there baroclinic instability or there is no baroclinic instability? Okay, can I take a minute to address that question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's really an important question. So, so what's going on here? Um, saying, we're saying that at the surface we just have turbulent diffusion and that we have some eddies in the atmosphere that are responsible for this turbulent diffusion. Where do those eddies come from? Okay. This down gradient diffusion of heat is producing eddy available potential energy, usual. Uh, so this down gradient flux is the source of these eddies. Okay. But I wouldn't call that, uh, so what's the sink of these eddies? Okay. Well, it's, it's some quasi-barotropic uh, wave breaking or uh, you know, transfer of energy to the mean flow, that sort of thing. It's, the sink is a little complicated. Most of that sink may occur in 
particular region of the atmosphere. But in any case, there's that's a, it's a, here's a picture that's of how the atmosphere works that doesn't use the word baroclinic instability. There's eddies in the atmosphere that induce a flow near the surface that transport heat down gradient. That down gradient heat transport is a source of energy for the eddies and that this upper troposphere, the troposphere as a whole is a reservoir for this eddy energy that's produced by this down gradient flux. And uh, you know, there's also a sink of that through various processes interacting with mean flows. And that's it. So, you know, that's the, that's the interaction between these, those two things. Uh, I haven't used the word baroclinic instability at all. And this is what I think synopticians would refer to as type two, back in the old days anyway. No, they still, it's just that you have a lot of eddy energy you know, migrating around in the upper troposphere. And that just induces a flow that transports heat. Uh, but you're not talking about how upper and lower tropospheric eddies are phasing, phase locking into a particular normal mode structure. You're thinking about is turbulent diffusion by eddies that have a source that's related to the down gradient transport. And it's the same thing in these turbulent simulations. Uh, the theory makes no reference to linear, the theory that I showed works very well for that model. It makes no reference to linear Baroclinic instability theory at all. Uh, so, instability is only for basically system in some uh, steady state and how it actually departs from it, but not actually, it does not explain the when system involved or really. <coughs> yeah, I think a finite amplitude, the argument would be it's rare, and this may not be true, in fact. <laughs> the argument would be it's rare to get this phase locking in normal mode like structures. You can probably. Uh, tell me that I'm wrong. And more often than not, you just have upper and lower tropospheric eddies floating by each other and uh, not locking that much. So you've, you've moved away from linear theory. Yeah, but I think back to the argument of the right scale, there's still kind of a linear energy inject yeah. injection scale, which is right. kind of instability. Yeah. In that turbulence picture, the, ra the role to raise the deformation, because the inverse cascade just occurs in, in this two-layer QG model anyway. That just occurs in the barotropic mode. You can take the, you can define, instead of talking about upper and lower layer flows, you can talk about the bar barotropic mode, which is the sum of the two, or the baroclinic mode, which is the difference between the two. And you can argue the inverse cascade is really only operating in that model on the vertically averaged flow. And <clears throat> so the radius of deformation is where you inject energy into the barotropic mode, which can then cascade. And then it diffuses, this diffusion, often you can think of it as a cascade of temperature variance back to smaller scales. It's just turbulent diffusion, mixing of temperature. So that's moving available potential energy back to smaller scales, back to the radius of deformation, where it then moves to the barotropic mode again. I skipped over that part of the talk. Uh, one more question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did you see blocking from some Blocking? Blocking of um, In these idealized models? I mean, yeah. I'm not sure. Well, I really haven't looked for it. Um, let me. The answer is I haven't looked at those idealized models. <laughs> But let me ask, answer a slightly different question. Does blocking affect this kind of uh, picture? I think if you look closely at the Atlantic here, you see some differences between these simple diffusive, I don't know if you can see it in this, the way I plot the, out of the arrows. But, but if you have low frequency variability and you have a diffusive picture that's operating on that low frequency varying flow, you can end up with a time mean pattern that doesn't look exactly diffusive because of the way that different heat fluxes in the different regimes add up. So things can be even more diffusive than they look here if you sort of take into account the, that in, in blocking type situations, the heat flux and temperature field may look very different. I don't know if that made sense. Okay, well let's take the remaining questions.
question so much, and let's thank mm -hmm. Dr. Hell. Mm -hmm. March is in 113.